Now the title of the message today is The Mystery of the Gospel, which is another message on the Gentile inclusion in Israel. How many of you were here last Shabbat, last Saturday? And it's in connection with that teaching on Yosef and Asenat, and also about the power of biblical adoption. And uh, you really need to uh, stay with me because there is uh, a lot of meat in this message. Somebody say, where's the beef, Rabbi Jim? Where's the beef? As most of you know, a major part of our vision is the unity of all believers, Jew and Gentile. Some of our favorite scriptures about unity is from Psalm 133, How good and pleasant it is for brethren and sisters to dwell together. Paul says in Galatians 3, 28, In him, meaning in Yeshua, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free. Paul adds in verse 29 of Galatians 3, And if you are in the Messiah, you are Abraham's seed and heirs, according to the promise. Romans 11, of course, tells us that Gentiles have been grafted into the olive tree of Israel. Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 2, Telling Gentiles who are no longer foreigners, no aliens, but fellow citizens with the Jewish people, part of the commonwealth or the larger dynasty of Israel. And of course, the words of Messiah in uh, the garden before he went to the tree of sacrifice, he prayed earnestly, Father, may they be one, even as we are one. Now, during the apostolic era, meaning during the first century, the first century messianic community, there was indeed great unity amongst all the believers. Jewish and Gentile believers were worshiping and hearing the word of God together uh, in the synagogues on Shabbat, according to Acts 13, verse 42 through 44, and Acts 15, verse 21. We're going to look at those a little bit later. And they were actually following the example of Yeshua. And Paul, if you could put up that PowerPoint again, please. Look at these scriptures. They were following the example of Yeshua, who himself attended and taught regularly in the synagogues on Shabbat. And if you want to jot down those scriptures, look it up later. Matthew 4, 23 and 9, 35. Mark chapter 1, verse 21, and chapter 6, verse 2. Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and Luke 6, verse 6, and Luke 13, verse 10. The Gospel of John 6, verse 59, and chapter 18, verse 20. Quite a few. They all will tell you that Yeshua attended and taught in the synagogues regularly on the Sabbath. And at that time also, Jew and Gentile alike were enjoying the spiritual status of the one new man in the Messiah that Paul speaks about in Ephesians 2.15. And now, as believers today, how many believers do we have here today? As believers today, our goal is to be an extension, an extension of that early Messianic Jewish community walking in the same spirit of unity in the Messiah. Let me add, if it was good enough for the first century apostles and disciples of Yeshua and for the early Messianic Jewish community, it should be good enough for us. Amen? Amen. Now, unfortunately, after the apostolic era, meaning the early centuries, the body of the Messiah became fragmented and divided largely due to the anti-Semitic policies of the early Roman church leaders, which included anti-Torah and replacement theology. The saying that God is finished with the Jews, that the church is the new Israel. We're all familiar with that broken record. And also, Gentiles who associated with the Jewish believers were themselves 
Gentile believers were themselves persecuted by the Roman Christians. How many of you have been persecuted yourself for embracing Messianic Judaism? How many of you heard things like, what are you going to that Jewish church for? Or things of that nature? Same spirit. And also at the same time, non-believing, non-believing Judaism put Jewish and Gentile believers out of the synagogues, which actually was a fulfillment of what Yeshua himself said in John 16, verse 2. And by the middle of the second century, Gentile believers were no longer embracing Messianic Judaism, but practicing traditional Christianity, with the exception of the sect of the Nazarenes, who were also called the Way, according to Acts chapter 9, verse 2, and other places in the Brit Hadashah. Now, the teaching really is, today is not a slam on Christianity. There are lots of wonderful churches out there. Not a slam on Christianity, but on those who come against Gentiles embracing their biblical Jewish roots in the Messiah. There's a difference. And this sect of the Nazarenes, also called the Way, was comprised of Jewish and Gentile believers in Yeshua. And they remained separate from traditional Christianity until at least the third century. But then after the third century, Constantine's Christianity took over, which was anti-Torah, anti-Jewish, and filled with pagan practices. But praise the Lord, as we all know, Messianic Judaism has been greatly restored in these last days. Somebody say amen. amen. Even in this generation, that especially has happened since Yom Ha'etz Ma'ut, Israeli Independence Day, in May of 1948, when Israel was back in the land speaking her own language, truly a miracle that never happened before. And that was also preceded one year before in 1947 by the discovery, or should I say, the resurrection of the Dead Sea Scrolls out of the caves of Qumran. And one of the primary manuscripts was from the prophet Isaiah. We know Isaiah brought forth so many wonderful messianic prophecies about Yeshua. And Isaiah also prophesied about the last days where Gentiles would honor the Sabbath in Isaiah chapter 56 and also that Gentiles would embrace the Torah of God. Um, I'm reminded of the Torah procession, the song that we sing, for the Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem for all of the nations. And today, praise the Lord, that many Jews, Jewish people are getting saved and many Christians are hungry for the Torah and for the Jewish roots or the biblical Jewish roots. And I like to think of that as that God is preparing us as the one bride of Messiah, hallelujah, making us all one for our soon coming heavenly bridegroom. And how many of you are looking forward to the coming of the King, hallelujah. Out of very soon, we're going to hear that shofar sound, we're going to hear the loud shout of an archangel, and we're going to see Yeshua coming on the clouds with great glory. Who's looking forward to the wedding supper of the Lamb? Hallelujah. We're living in very exciting times. Now, in spite of all that, even in the Messianic Jewish movement today, there is a wide variety of opinions on the Gentile inclusion in the body of Messiah when it comes to issues like Torah observance. Do Gentiles have the right to call themselves Israel? Should Gentile believers be welcomed in Messianic Jewish synagogues or should they be attending Christian churches? Do Gentiles have the right to chant the Jewish liturgical prayers from the Siddur, or in our case, from the PowerPoint screen? Uh. 
Do Gentiles have full equal status as the Jewish believer? Well, if you were here for last week's teaching about the story of Yosef and Asenat and the power of biblical adoption, we know the answer is definitely yes. They have full equal status as the Jewish believer. But some of these negative opinions have actually made Gentiles think of themselves as second-class citizens in the kingdom of God, almost feeling segregated, like they have to sit in the back of the bus. But let me tell you that it's not going to ever happen here because we are a spirit-filled, Torah-observant, Messianic Jewish congregation on fire for Yeshua, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you believe that, you will be able to talk about Amen. But as a result of those negative opinions, many Gentiles, who by the way have every right to be frustrated, Many Gentiles are going at great lengths to prove that they are Jewish for greater acceptance. And some of them are actually frantically searching out their genealogies for Jewish blood ancestry. Some are converting legally to Judaism through circumcision of the flesh and by going into the mikvah. Now, let me clarify, we go into the mikvah each year as a congregation, but not for those reasons, more so to rededicate our lives to the Lord as a time of new beginnings, and we go in as the bride of Messiah, which was part of the ancient Jewish wedding customs. Some are embracing what's called the two-house theology, which teaches that most Gentile believers in North America were the descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel because of the genetic dispersion of those ten tribes throughout the centuries. Some are even planning to make Aliyah, to move to Israel, but for the wrong reasons. Perhaps to prove to themselves uh, that they are more Jewish this way. But what we must remember we must remember that our identity is first and foremost rooted in Yeshua. Hallelujah. Because Yeshua, he has done everything that we need to share in the commonwealth of Israel. Through him, Gentile believers are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. It's in Yeshua that we uh, live and move and have our being. Our lives are hidden in the Messiah. Somebody say, it's all about Yeshua. Hallelujah. And if you're a believer, and I always like to say this, if you're a believer in Yeshua, whether Jew or Gentile, you have the spirit of a very Jewish Messiah already living inside of you. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm minimizing Torah observance or attending Messianic Jewish synagogues or chanting the liturgical prayers for the Gentiles. I'm fully encouraging that. Most of you know this is a large part of our vision over the years. But Gentiles just shouldn't be doing it merely to be seen in the eyes of men, but rather in the eyes of God. Or in other words, not for appearance sake, but because the Holy Spirit is leading you in that direction. Amen? Amen. And you know, when the light bulb goes on, the Holy Spirit is leading you. Obey, follow, because he's leading you to a place of blessing. Now, on the flip side, that doesn't mean that Christians are the new Israel. It means that Gentile believers are part of a greater collective that is variously called the following, the Israel of God, the Commonwealth of Israel, the Assembly of Believers, the people of God, and sometimes metaphorically, the Kingdom of Heaven. Now I know that that was a pretty uh, lengthy introduction, but a very important one, especially on this subject of the Gentile inclusion in Israel. And today, 
we're going to look into the book of Acts and the book of Ephesians, taking a closer look at Paul, Rav Shaul, who was an apostle to the Gentiles, according to Acts chapter 9, 15, and Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. And Paul was most definitely the most effective of Yeshua's disciples for preaching and for spreading the gospel or the good news. Let me also add that Paul suffered greatly for his passion in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles, suffered greatly for including them in the arena of Israel. In particular, Paul suffered at the hands of the non-believing Jewish community which included him nearly, uh, being nearly uh, beaten to death and thrown into prison. And listen carefully, not because he was proclaiming the death and the resurrection and the messianic office of Yeshua, it wasn't for that reason, but rather it was the message of the inclusion of the Gentiles that brought the wrath of Jerusalem on Paul's head. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians was written by Paul during his two-year imprisonment in Rome in the year 60 AD. Again, the title of the message is The Mystery of the Gospel. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to be reading verse 19 and 20. Ephesians 6, verse 19. And for me, as in, and pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So what is the mystery of the gospel? Why exactly is Paul in chains? We know that Paul and Silas were in chains before in Acts chapter 16. And we could naturally assume that the mystery of the gospel for which Paul was in chains was for preaching the gospel of Yeshua's death and his resurrection, but as we've seen, that would be wrong. At the time of Paul's arrest, Yaakov, Yeshua's brother, was also in Jerusalem preaching the same gospel. So were thousands of Jewish believers, again, who all were zealous for God's Torah, myriads, says Acts 21, verse 20. And none of them were being arrested or dragged before the Sanhedrin, marched off to Caesarea or sent to Rome as Paul was. See, Paul was arrested for supposedly, supposedly bringing a Gentile into the temple area. Let's turn to Acts chapter 21. Acts 21, and we're going to be reading verses 27 through 30. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, meaning the non-believing Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, meaning Paul, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, against the Torah, and against this place, meaning the temple. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now this is a very important parenthetical statement made by Luke here, who is the writer of Acts, verse 29. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Again, an important comment by Luke clarifying that these charges against Paul were untrue. Verse 30, And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately 
the doors were shut. So Paul was attacked by an angry mob of Jews, not for proclaiming the gospel of Yeshua, but supposedly for bringing a Gentile into the temple. And it's not that Gentiles weren't allowed in the temple's outer court. From the court of the Gentiles, men and women from the nation could worship the God of Israel. That was scriptural, that was in the Tanakh, because in Isaiah, Again, chapter 56, Hashem said, My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. But they, meaning the Gentiles, just couldn't proceed from the court of the Gentiles and enter the temple proper under penalty of death. There was a, a dividing wall called a sorek. It was about four feet high, and that actually separated Gentile worshipers from the inner courts of the temple what did that mean? That Gentiles could only worship from a distance. Think about that. Because it's the same today to those who say Gentiles have no right to the Torah, or to Shabbat, or to the festivals, or to chanting the liturgical prayers. Metaphorically speaking, that is saying that Gentiles also could only worship from a distance. And you know that's never going to happen during the millennial reign of the Messiah. Because Isaiah, again, in chapter 56, God says, Do not let the son of the foreigner say, The Lord has separated me from his people. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and an everlasting name that shall never be cut off. You know, God has a special place in his heart for Gentiles, just as he does for the Jewish people. And that's another factor that makes us all one, that connects us all as one. Somebody say, we are one. We are one. In the Lord. In the Lord. <laughs> now, consequently, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 to the Gentiles, You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah, for he himself is our peace and has made both one and has broken down the middle wall or partition. Now we were reading there in Acts chapter 21 and the following verses of Acts 21 tells us that Paul was almost beaten to death by the non-believing Jews but after being rescued by a Roman garrison he asked for permission to address the angry crowd who became silent when he motioned to them with his hand. I believe there was divine intervention happening. And beginning in Acts chapter 22, Paul tells the crowd his testimony, what happened to him, and he tells them in the Hebrew language how he was a Jew, a Pharisee who studied under Gamaliel, how he persecuted the Jewish believers in Yeshua, his encounter with Yeshua on the road to Damascus, how he was blinded by the light and how his sight was restored through the prayer of Ananias, how he was praying in the temple, seeing a vision of Yeshua and speaking with him. And to all of this, to all of this testimony that Paul was giving, the crowd had no objection until Paul mentions one thing. Let's read Acts 22, beginning with verse 21. Then he, Paul is saying, then he, meaning Yeshua, said to me, and that was back in Acts 9, 15, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until, underline that word, until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. And then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So again, it was not the gospel of Yeshua as Messiah that caused the riot to resume, but the Gentile inclusion into 
Israel through the Messiah of Israel. This was the mystery of the gospel for which Paul is subsequently arrested, tried before the Sanhedrin, marched to Caesarea, and eventually shipped to Rome, where he writes his letters to all the congregations from Ephesus and for us to hear and understand today. I'd like you to get a feeling of what Paul went through, taking a stand for the inclusion of Gentiles in the commonwealth of Israel. We're all benefiting from that today. Now Paul and Barnabas earlier were preaching in a synagogue in Antioch in the province of Galatia. So let's turn there to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and let's read verse 26. And again, this is a similar scenario to what happened in Acts chapter 21 and 22. Acts 13, verse 26. Paul is speaking. Men and brethren, underline the word brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, underline sons of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, underline those who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. Let's take a closer look at these three categories. Brothers, sons of Abraham, and those among you who fear God. All to whom the gospel has been sent. As far as brothers, Paul is referring to his fellow Jewish brothers, meaning they are ethnically Jewish, Born Jewish as the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Second category, sons of Abraham. They were actually proselytes to the Jewish faith. They were Gentiles who made a formal legal conversion to Judaism, again through physical circumcision and entering into the mikvah. But when they did that, they were no longer regarded as Gentiles. They could marry within the Jewish community and they could even offer a sacrifice at the temple. They were reborn, these proselytes, as son of Abraham, and they now had full legal Jewish status. Even non-believing Judaism referred to them as being born again, that was a rabbinic term for proselytes who legally converted to Judaism. The third category, those among you who fear God, those would be God-fearing Gentiles, non-Jews, but they were Gentiles who were attracted to Judaism. They were Gentiles who were turning from a life of paganism. They were, you might say, tolerated by the non-believing Jews in the synagogues and probably appreciated for their financial contributions just like the centurion who built a synagogue for the Jewish people in Luke 7, just like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 who gave generously to the Jewish people. You know, God even sent an angel to thank Cornelius for his generosity. But this third category, God-fearing Gentiles, they not, were not regarded as Jews, therefore they did not have equal status as Jews, according to the non-believing Jews. Now in the following verses of Acts 13, verse 27 through 41, Paul fully preaches the gospel of the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. He quotes from the Psalms and from the prophets that the gospel is for everyone. And this was really a packed synagogue full of Jewish people and they were warmly accepting the message of the gospel and even inviting Paul and Barnabas to speak more on this topic the following Shabbat. That in itself is pretty amazing. That would be like if I went into a non-believing Jewish synagogue and preached about Yeshua and they actually invited me to come back the following week. 
Wow, let's just speak that right into the spirit of the Holy Spirit right now. Hallelujah. Just read verses 42 and 43. Still in Acts 13. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And verse 43, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews, the non-believing Jews and the devout proselytes, those who were called the sons of Abraham, they followed Paul and Barnabas, maybe down into the fellowship area, and who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So no problem here. With the Jews and the legal proselytes to Judaism, even persuaded Paul and Barnabas to return the next week. However, there was a big surprise, and that was the attendance the following week was a huge surprise, especially to the Jews. Let's pick it up in verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city, the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. They became jealous. And contradicting and even blaspheming, now they opposed the things spoken by Paul. And then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, Again, to the Jew first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, that's pretty heavy, behold, we now turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have sent you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Quoting from Isaiah 42, verse 6, and Isaiah 49, verse 6. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews, they stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city. They raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. What does that remind you of? Of, it's like when the Pharisees stirred up the people to have Yeshua crucified when he appeared before Pilate. Similar scenario. Now the vast majority of the Gentiles who were there and who were saved by the gospel, they provoked the Jews to jealousy. But how sad that the Jews went in the wrong direction. You know, we're supposed to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy, says Romans 11. And actually, that's what they were doing, the Gentiles. But the Jews went in the wrong direction. Instead of receiving the gospel themselves, by the way, and they were already getting hungry from the week before, they were offended by the number of Gentiles who were in attendance and who received the gospel, probably because that was now becoming a threat to the Jewish identity in the local synagogues. You know, let me say something here. Do you know that most Messianic Jewish congregations, except in Israel, have a greater majority of Gentiles in attendance than those of actual Jewish descent? Gentiles who have the spirit of Ruth, wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Gentiles who love Israel and the Jewish people and who pray for them daily. Gentiles who are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. Gentiles who love God's Messiah, God's Torah, God's festivals. Gentiles who want to honor and who delight in the Sabbath and want to keep it holy. Gentiles who want to say the Sabbath prayers, the liturgical prayers, which are anointed and give praise to God. This is hard to believe, but I have witnessed it. There are still, though, Messianic Jewish congregations today 
who say to Gentile believers, oh, I'm glad that you have faith in Yeshua, but honestly, you're not welcome here. Go find a nice church. You're interfering with our mission to the Jewish people. And all I can say to those who think like that is shame on you. How can you think that way? Haven't you read your Bible? Are you greater than the apostles of Yeshua? Are you greater than God who clearly says himself that he wants unity in all of his house? Are you greater than Yeshua who said there will be one flock and one shepherd? Are you greater than the Messiah who prayed, Father, may they be one, even as we are one? You know, God looks down on our congregation and many congregations like it, and he sees Jew and Gentile worshiping him in one accord, and you know what? He smiles. Now let's go a little deeper. There was another reason why the Jews in Antioch turned on Paul and Barnabas. Because Paul's gospel gave the God-fearing Gentiles status in the Jewish community without requiring them to go through the legal conversion process. Meaning what? Circumcision. This topic of circumcision is a big one. It was a scathing issue in the first century Messianic community. Paul was saying that they were now sons of Abraham like the proselytes, but they were sons of Abraham just by merit of faith in Yeshua. And again, Galatians 3.29 says, If you are in the Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Gentiles can now be regarded as brothers with the Jewish people. We saw that in the teaching last week, the power of biblical adoption. And when Paul says Gentiles, he means real Gentiles. Do I dare say goyim? Real Gentiles who did not have to be circumcised in the flesh to be part of the Jewish community. And that was quite opposite, if you remember, from the believing, even the believing Pharisees in Acts chapter 15, and other heresies who were insisting that Gentiles must be circumcised and obey all of the Torah in order to really be saved. Otherwise, they were excluded from Israel. Let's turn to Romans chapter 2. And again, see what Paul had to say about this subject of circumcision. Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and verse 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. You know, Paul also adds in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, listen to this, you got to love this. He adds, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is being a new creature in the Messiah. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Let's remember that Yeshua died for the circumcised and the uncircumcised. That we can all be part of the kingdom of God of God, and I don't understand why that word during the worship came forth, about the kingdom of God. 
If someone had to be circumcised for salvation after Yeshua's death on the cross, it would mean that Yeshua's sacrifice was not good enough. Now a couple of more scriptures. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to first read verses 1 through 9. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Messiah Yeshua, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God that was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Messiah, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that the manifold wisdom and the eternal purposes of God, the salvation to the Gentiles that was always in the heart of God. It was spoken of by the prophets, but now it's being fully revealed in Yeshua. Now it's really happening. That's what Paul is saying here. Let's move on, verse six that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise and Messiah through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Messiah and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Messiah Yeshua. As we read these verses, you know, this is some really deep stuff. Paul was speaking about a mystery that has been kept hidden in God for ages. And Paul also believes it's a mystery with which he was entrusted. And this became Paul's passion. It was a secret that was concealed for all the ages of creation. The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. It's the mystery of the gospel. It's the mystery of the Messiah. Three more verses. Let's read verse 9 through 11. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Yeshua the Messiah to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be known by the church, it reads Ecclesia, called out ones, by the assembly, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That's rich. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. The mystery of the gospel, again, the Gentile inclusion in Israel is according to God's eternal purpose. And those are some pretty big words. The eternal purpose of God, that's big. What does that mean? Well, Paul explains in verse 10, that God's intent was that now through the assembly, through us, through the body of believers in Yeshua, 
that the manifold wisdom of God is going to be known by principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. Paul was saying here first that through Messiah that God is in the business of saving human souls and he's adding that when the Lord takes Gentile people away from their pagan gods, there is nothing that rulers, authorities, or principalities can do about it. Every Gentile that's taken from the false gods of this world and joined to the people of Israel represents a loss of territory and prestige for the enemy. Amen. Hallelujah. When you as a Gentile receive Yeshua as Messiah, the enemy really took it in Lavanza. <laughs> because it represented a loss of his territory and prestige. And that is the manifold wisdom of God. It's God's plan of universal dominion. God's universal dominion. Gentile believers are God's, you might say, tokens of victory in an ancient struggle against darkness. And maybe this is where the phrase token Gentile comes from. But the eternal purpose of God is the redemption of the whole world. Now, we could go a little deeper here. How many of you want to go a little bit deeper into the Word? This week's Torah portion, the exodus from Egypt set the pattern. In this week's Torah portion, Shemot, we heard the reading earlier. In Exodus 3.20, God says, I will strike Egypt down and they will let you go. When God took the Israelites out of Egypt and away from Pharaoh and his gods, that was just the beginning of the manifold wisdom and the eternal purpose of God. True, Israel was God's trophy. And he used the Exodus to establish his great name. But that Exodus actually pointed toward or foreshadowed a second greater Exodus an exodus that began under the blood of a greater lamb. And it is the exodus of all nations. As God redeems Gentiles and joins them to his people Israel, he is repeating the exodus over and over again, and there is nothing that the enemy can do about it. Hallelujah. So as you can see, the eternal purpose of God is bigger. It's bigger than just my personal salvation, bigger than your salvation. It's bigger than the liberation from Egypt. It's bigger than even the salvation of Israel. God's eternal purpose is that his wisdom, his manifold wisdom, is going to be known to rulers and authorities in heavenly realms that he's going to take away everything that they once had and redeem for himself a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And Paul understood this. This was the mystery of the gospel. This was his passion. This was God's eternal purpose. God has ordained unity for all believers since the beginning of time. And not only that, he has given us the power and the authority to proclaim that unity. How many of you are glad we are all one in the Messiah? Hallelujah. Let's all stand, please. Let's have the worship team come back up as we sing that new song again. The Anachnu Echad. Those of you who want to come forward, take a stand for that unity.
that we have in the Messiah. Please do so. Oh, no. 